Tonight, P. Egan will tell us much more about Edward S. Curtis. Egan's book details the photograph the photographer's ambitious quest and his journey in documenting the stories and rituals of more than 80 tribes. If you haven't read Egan's book, it's available in various formats from the Bellingham Public Library. It's also available, available for purchase tonight in the lobby. Seattle-based Timothy Egan is the author of seven books, a longtime journalist and a graduate of the University of Washington. <laughs> Egan also writes an online opinion column for the New York Times. In the past, he roamed the West as a national correspondent for the New York Times. And in 2001, he shared a Pulitzer Prize with a team of reporters for the series, How Race is Lived in America. In Indian country, I'd have to say, he's pretty fancy. <laughs> Tonight's presentation is the signature event of Watka Museum's current exhibition, Mingled Visions, Images from the North American Indian by Edward S. Curtis. The ex exhibition will be on display through May 10th. Special thanks goes to all of tonight's sponsors. That includes the Bellingham Public Library, the Friends of the Bellingham Public Library, the Watka Museum, and Village Books. Let's give a warm round of applause for them. We also wish to thank BTV because BTV is recording this and they're going to be replaying it for anybody who couldn't be here with this great crowd tonight. <laughs> Lastly, we'd like to thank the Mount Baker Theater. Through the theater's partnership with the city of Bellingham, we were able to hold tonight's presentation in this beautiful venue. And isn't it great that it was free of charge for everybody's benefit? So we just have three housekeeping items. After the presentation, Timothy will take questions from the audience. You'll have an opportunity to have him sign books in the lobby afterwards. And we ask that you please fill out an evaluation form to help us plan and secure funding for future events. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our exciting and very special guest, Mr. Timothy Egan. Springtime, Bellingham, and a capacity crowd. What more could you ask for? <laughs> if only the Mariners would win. <laughs> They're up to nothing, I just checked. Uh, thank you, Roxanne, for that extraordinary introduction. I told her if I could sing, I was gonna do Sting's version of Roxanne. <clears throat> but I can't sing, still. Wonderful introduction, and thank you for bringing me back to one of my favorite spots on this just great day. I was lucky enough to have a run along the waterfront here and looking one way at the Olympus, looking another way back at Mount Baker, and just after a while, the endorphins are kicking in, and I'm just on this high of fused nature and sweating, and I started babbling to myself, you know. <laughs> so, um, I hope you stay with me for about 40 minutes because I'm gonna take you on a journey about the most extraordinary, absolutely most extraordinary photographic achievement of all time, I think. The only one that's sorta of close is Matthew Brady, the Civil War photographer of the 1860s. It's a masterpiece that was appreciated as with most masterpieces only after the artist was gone. It's a man who gave up everything for this masterpiece, his family, his net worth, he died broke and alone, and he even lost the copyright to this. But it is widely recognized now as the premier achievement in American photography. And the most important thing about this is he brought, not, it was a masterpiece, and it is a masterpiece, but it's what, what it means for the subjects, that 
Native Americans were so long stereotyped, so long ignored, and Curtis, Edward Curtis, this man with a sixth grade education, tried to see the humanity in them, tried to see a people that were not cigar store Indians, were not stereotypes, tried to see human beings, and he wanted to make them live forever. Now, Curtis was a homestead kid, came here from the Midwest. His dad was a sickly Civil War preacher. They moved from Wisconsin, tired of the winters, and homesteaded on Puget Sound in the late 1870s. And they no sooner arrived than the old man died. And so Curtis raised with his mother three other children in a little log cabin. His aspiration in life was perhaps to work at the local mill or maybe, be, maybe, if he was lucky, become a brick mason. Now, when he was 21 years old, he was out on one of those logs you see on Puget Sound all the time in the old pictures, and he fell off of that thing and badly mangled his spine. He broke several vertebrae and spent almost an entire year on his back. And in that time he spent on his back, he learned to look at the world. He learned to see how a single raindrop on the leaf of a rhododendron could hold all the colors of a rainbow. He learned that the light wasn't just special at magic hour, which every photographer knows about, but that every single hour of the day had a different way to hold the day and hold the light. So he became an observer of people, of light, and at the same time he started to fool around with this camera that his Civil War father had, per had brought home. And he purchased another camera from someone who had moved through, and he started to take pictures. He then, when he rehabilitated himself, um, said that he was no longer going to work as a laborer. His aspiration was to become a photographer. So he moved and left. His mother was very disappointed in this because he mortgaged their homestead for $200 which is all they could get for the cabin. And he took that $200, he moved across the water, he was living near Port Orchard, to Seattle, and he bought in with that $200 with a, another portrait photographer. Within 10 years' time, he is the premier portrait photographer on the West Coast. There was something about how he could capture people's faces, something about how he could capture personality, something about how he could hold a human being in his camera lens that made him special. So he quickly rises to fame. He, by the end of the 1890s, he is on his way to becoming the Annie Leibovitz of his day. People come to Seattle to have their picture taken by him. He's got a list of debutantes waiting six months to have their picture taken by him. He's got bankers willing to pay him top dollar. Believe me, I leafed through all the pictures of bankers and merchants uh, which the Rainier Club in Seattle houses, which is another story because that was a Curtis one-time home. But he's bored. He's tired of his early achievement. He wants to do something else. And so in his late 20s, there he is. He's a dapper fellow. Looks like Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> uh, they're trying to get Brad Pitt to play him in the movie, but, uh, you know, these things take forever, and Brad Pitt will be an old man by the time <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm holding out for Edward Norton. Um, he's six foot, four inches tall, has blue eyes. Both men and women are drawn to him. He's charismatic, has a very special quality about him. He's a bit of a dandy, too. There's something kind of lacking in heft in him at this age because he's, he's risen so quickly. Now, in 1896, Seattle is an absolutely booming city. Uh, they are in the process of leveling the hills, knocking off all the hills of Seattle, and making it into this huge megalopolis. It's sort of like with Amazon.com right now. Um, one of the periodic total remakes of Seattle. And the city is named for Chief South, Chief Seattle. But it is the only, it is on its way to becoming the largest city in the world named for a Native American, but they've passed a law making it illegal for a Native American to live within the city ordinance. So they make one exception to this. Princess Angeline, who is the so-called last surviving member of the Duwamish tribe. There are others, but they, she's the only one they see. They let her live in this little waterfront shack down just in front of downtown. It's a 
400 square foot off slope, um, off plum, I should say, uh, little dirty one room. And she digs clams for a living and goes door to door and sells them to the prosperous people of this booming city that's outlawed Indians. And she takes people's laundry in. And the little kids throw rocks at her. So she carries around, her, her dress has rocks in it. She fires back at them. And no one really knows how old she is. They, they're charmed by having this presence. It reaffirms their image that the Native Americans are a thing of the past, that the, here's this last old surviving member. One day, Edward Curtis is walking down um, steep hills of Seattle, which they were trying to erase. And he looks out on the waterfront there on what was then called West Street, now it's called Western Avenue, and he sees this tiny little elfin figure stooped over in a silhouette against the Olympic Mountains, and she's digging clams. It's Princess Angeline. He starts a negotiation with her that takes place over three days, and eventually he convinces her to come up a few blocks up the hill to his studio. He wants to take her picture. This is the first picture he will take of a Native American. Now, he pays her for his time. He gives her a silver dollar for the sitting, which was actually quite a lot of money then, about a day and a half's worth of labor. And she asks a couple questions about what he wants her to do. He says, no, no, I want you just as you are. And this is the picture he gets. It's the first picture he takes of a Native American. She's wearing the shawl you can see you can probably see her cane there in the lower left hand corner and what i love about this picture what i absolutely love about it is this searing look away image she has it's sort of like you can't kill me like i know you're taking over the city i know my people's day is gone but you can't take this away from me curtis loves the picture and so does everyone who sees it. This quickly, with several other pictures, becomes a phenomenon. It wins an international photography award. It goes off to Paris. And within a year's time, it's on display in the Louvre. So Curtis gets this idea that there may be something. Now, he's still sort of a, I don't want to say a knave, but he's sort of superficial. He's sort of a dandy. He sort of sees Indians as a commodity, that maybe he can make money off these dying people as he shoots them in his mitts. So he starts to look around the Puget Sound area for other native people who are being erased from the place where they've lived for perhaps 10,000 years. This is an almost never seen picture I got from the Mazamas Climbing Club in Portland, Oregon. Um, the Mazamas liked Curtis, because you'll see in a few minutes, he was quite the alpinist and uh, took many of their Mount Rainier pictures. These are two natives Curtis found on the lower slopes of Mount St. Helens one day when he was climbing Helens. And it's, it's historically interesting because it's way before he became Edward Curtis. He's just tromping through the woods here and he takes this picture. This is the picture, the other picture of Angeline. This is the one that attracted Curtis to her to begin with. And he calls this picture the clam digger. It will eventually be, this is right in front of Seattle. This is right at the waterfront where there is now a big Ferris wheel. You can probably see a little bit of Bainbridge Island behind there. Um, so this picture and this picture, the basket weaver, which is a, another coastal Salish native woman slightly farther north, I think this is a Tulalip, form this package of pictures that go out and start to give Curtis a name as something more than a portrait photographer. Now, the interesting secret about Curtis's life at this point, though he's a somewhat of a celebrity, and he married the woman who was then 16, who tended to him during the year that he was on his back, falls in love with her when she helps nurse him back to health. She comes over to Seattle, despite her parents' objection, marries Edward Curtis. He's madly in love with her. He will never marry anyone else, but their marriage ends tragically. Um, they're quite the celebrity couple. But the interesting thing about Curtis is he's just a few years removed from being a person who picked berries for a living. He's just a few years removed from a forager. He's just a few years removed from a person who's basically living as these native people are living. He's doing, he had to do all the things they did just to make his own subsistence living in that little homestead cabin. And he never forgets that part of his life. Now, I mentioned that Curtis um, 
had a mountain climbing side to him. You can see that fellow in the white dress pressed shirt in the far left. That's Edward Curtis on Mount Rainier in 1898. And because in 1898, if you're going to climb Mount Rainier in the late Victorian age, you must do it in a white pressed dress shirt. <laughs> With, with two acolytes schlepping your gear as well. He's, he's, not, he's not going to be the Indian photographer at this point. He thinks he's going to be the mountain photographer. But he's, he's interested in the things that the city of Seattle and the, all the white settlers are erasing. He's interested in native people and native flora. He likes the habitat of the Northwest. He he's, he's just says, oh my God, I can't believe we have this stuff in our midst. So he takes over the course of several years, amazing pictures of Rainier, and he could have just been a nature photographer, and you'll see in a few minutes how his work influenced Ansel Adams. Um, I should mention that uh, he had a brother, Ashel Curtis, uh, who took about 40,000 pictures in his own right, but Ashel was the anti-Edward Curtis, and they had a huge fight at the start of the 20th century apparently over who owned these Alaska pictures, and they didn't speak to each other for the rest of their lives. And so you'll, you'll often hear about Ashel Curtis. He, be, he took pictures of buildings being erected, streets being paved, um, all the stuff of industry, in addition to some nature photographs as well, but in some ways he was trying to defy his brother. Uh, and the one Indian picture that Ashel took is of a woman begging with her hand out in Pike Place Market, so he was almost trying to throw this at Curtis's face. What changes in Curtis's life, what launches him on this amazing journey, is in 1901, excuse me, in, 19, in 1899, he's up on Mount Rainier, and he stumbles upon these three knuckleheads who are coming out of a fog on the Nisqually Glacier. They've got their gentleman's tweed on, and they're from the East Coast, and they're just hopelessly lost and hypothermic, as you can be in July on Mount Rainier when the clouds come in. And Curtis has got his little camp up there at Camp Muir. He's been running up and down the mountain. He's in great shape. He's spent about six weeks up there, and he rescues these three gentlemen. Well, they turn out to be three of the most powerful gentlemen in early 20th century America. One of them is the head of the National Geographic. One of them is Gifford Pinchot, the head of the Forest Service. <laughs> They're scouting Mount Rainier for an addition to the national park system. Um, and the other one is George Bird Grinnell, founder of the Audubon Society, and also one of the few Anglos who really does know Indians, having spent 30 years with the Plains Indians. And his nickname, Bird, the Indians gave him because he would show up and spend all summer with the Plains Indians and then disappear like a bird as the fall came. And Curtis shows Grinnell his pictures, and Grinnell is fascinated. He says, my God, this guy has something. But he says to him, if you want to really know Indians, come with me next summer to Montana, and I'll show you a true tribe, the true essence of a people. Now, remember, Curtis has only seen scraps remnants, poor people, old people, broken people, that fits the narrative that they're past tense people. So he arranges to go to Montana with George Bird Grinnell and witness the sun dance and the ceremony that takes place over a week in August. And he's absolutely amazed when he arrives on the plains of Montana. This is just east of Glacier National Park. He sees not a few people living the last days of his life, of their lives, but he sees an intact community. Uh, young people, old people, uh, intact families, healthy people, living somewhat by the old ways and performing this wonderful ritual that they have performed for as long as they've been on the prairie. And this sort of begins the Curtis Odyssey. He says to Grinnell, I think I want to shoot these people before they disappear. I want to shoot native people intact somewhat living by their old ways. Now, Curtis is um, a little hyper, you know, a little, you know, he's not that sensitive at this point. He's, you have to understand how he takes these pictures. He's carrying around this, these glass plate negatives. Each, each picture is about the size of this. So he has to take a glass plate 
and put it into his standing camera and then expose it to the subject or the light. He never used artificial light. All his portraits are his manipulating the flap of his tent. Take this image, then take the glass plate negative and put it in his pack and go down the mountain or go down the, by canoe wherever he went. So it's a painstaking process. He's jumping around and he's not getting anywhere with the pagan and the Blackfeet. And um, Grinnell tells him to just relax. Don't take a picture for several weeks. Just get to know the people. Because initially they throw rocks at him. They charge him with their horse. They don't want him around. One of the people threatens to run him off the reservation, chases him with his horse. This person, at the end of the summer, poses for Curtis. And Curtis calls this picture Pagan Dandy. And I like it because it's a projection of one dandy on another. <laughs> They're both sort of out staring each other here. Now, it's, it's a wonderful portrait, and it, it, it's very early on. This is the dawn of the 20th century. And this starts, starts the Curtis journey. And he will do two things. He will shoot portraits because he's a portrait photographer. Now, the people who criticize Curtis for posing Indians Forget that fact. He's a portrait photographer. That's what he does. He shoots portraits. He's not Ken Burns doing a documentary. He shoots portraits. He wants faces. He wants to know. He, every time he shoots a picture, he says, what has value to you? So they'll show up with, when this guy showed up with his hair like this, that's exactly what Curtis wanted, because this is the, how this guy wanted his picture taken. So this launches the Curtis journey. Now, Consider the United States at the dawn of the 20th century. We are a nation of 75 million people. There's these sputtering internal combustion engines driving around, pushing cars around. We've pushed native people to the far corners and nooks and crannies of the United States. They're either living out on the coast where the Macaw are. They're living at the bottom of the Grand Canyon where the Havasupai are. They're living on the top of a mile-high mesa where the Acoma are in the New Mexico. They're out of sight where the Hopi and Navajo are in the center of Arizona territory. They're disappeared. They're moved out of sight. They're, they're in these crannies. We have 75 million Americans. And for the first time, they do an exhaustive census of Indians at the start of the 20th century. And what do they find? From a population that was perhaps 20 million people at the start of European contact 400 years before, there are now 200,000 natives in all the United States. So they're down by 99%. So the consensus view is they'll be gone in a generation's time. Now, what's killing them, of course, is they don't have immunity to Anglo diseases to European diseases, all the things that Europeans have long developed immunity to, everything from the flu to polio to measles, kills them. It kills them in large groups. So um, people think they're going to be gone. And Curtis, at the same time, that's what gives him urgency. He thinks, my God, I've got to hurry. I don't know how many of these people are going to be around. I don't know how many tribes there's going to be. So he starts on this great journey. Now, in 1903, there are three famous Native Americans living in the United States. This is one of them. I'm sure everybody knows who this is. A, a fellow Washingtonian, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce. And he is living as essentially a prisoner of war on the Colville Indian Reservation, having surrendered after the 1877 Nez Perce War, which was no war at all. Actually, it was a chase where the cavalry chased the Nez Perce for something like 1,800 miles down through the Snake River Canyon, up through Yellowstone. They got just short of the Canadian border, and Joseph famously said, I will fight no more forever. So they put him on this crappy little reservation, the Colvilles. He has no attachment to the people living in the north part. His people live in Joseph, Oregon. His people live in the Wallaba Valley, in this verdant, wonderful, beautiful valley. He's miserable. He can't leave this reservation without permission of the President of the United States. Well, a bunch of well-meaning people in Seattle arranged to have Chief Joseph come to Seattle in 1903 to watch a University of Washington football game. <laughs> my, my dogs, I was happy to hear there were a few Huskies in the audience, were then called the Sun Dodgers. And, which is an interesting name, and they played uh, up on a crappy field on Capitol Hill. And so um, Chief Joseph is put up in this nice hotel in downtown Seattle, 
and they take him by streetcar up to, to watch this University of Washington football game. And they ask him later what he thought of it. And he said, through a translator, because he never spoke the language, he said, I saw a lot of white men almost fight each other today. I don't think this is a good thing. <laughs> now, afterward, on Sunday, Curtis brings Chief Joseph into his studio. And he takes two pictures of him. This one with the headdress, and this one, which is my favorite. And he understands, he asks Joseph, why are you wearing your hair like that? Why do you have the braids in the front and it's swept back like that? He says, you can't wear your hair like that unless you have killed, scalped a live man. Not a dead man, but a live man. Why do you have your earrings like that? Well, these earrings have significance. Why do you have those beads like that? Everything he's wearing, everything he's accessorizing himself with has meaning. And Curtis, this, this is where he sort of falls for the Nez Perce. They be, I mean, you can't help but to fall for the Nez Perce. Their story is tragic, but they were such an amazing group of people, having basically saved Lewis and Clark from starvation, having never actively gone to war with the Americans, having their treaty broken, and having their land taken from them. The, the old story of natives, of course. Um, and Joseph became this, you know, he became known as the Indian Napoleon all over the world for having eluded the cavalry. But what Curtis finds out by sitting with him was he was no warrior. All he did was save his people. All he did was hide. All he did was keep the cavalry from catching him. He's more interested in him as a man. He's more interested in him as a person who still has the old stories in him. So he develops this very close friendship with Chief Joseph. And six months after this picture is taken, Joseph, back in the Culver Reservation, dies. And the reservation doctor said famously that Joseph died of a broken heart. And his widow did not cut her hair for a year, as is the Nez Perce custom. And then she asked Edward Curtis to come to Colville on a hot summer day and rebury her husband. He dug the grave up, pulled the body out, and put it in a different grave where she wanted him to be. That's how close they were. So again, he feels this great sense of urgency and he starts to run, his photography business just goes by the wayside. He's, he's not tending the portrait business at all. This is a picture of a Hopi woman and child and one of the motifs that Curtis will do throughout is mother and child. Again, shot entirely with natural light. He usually shot in his tent and would just manipulate the flap to get the light there. And he does, Outside of the Nez Perce, he, he loves the Hopi, he loves the Navajo. He goes back to see the Hopi more than a dozen times over 20 years. In fact, he spends two years with them before he takes a single picture. And you'll see why he got such great pictures with the Hopi. Now, he, he has decided to do this big deal thing. It's going to be called the North American Indian. And his goal is to shoot every Native American tribe still living somewhat by the old ways. He has no idea how many of them there are or how far he'll have to go. And as he gets into this project, he also says, I want to tell their nation story, their creation myths. I want to be an uh, ethnic interpreter. I want to say what people ate, what their sexual habits were like. So this thing gets expanded beyond merely taking pictures of people, but telling their nation stories, telling their creation myths. So he hires a number of people. He hires a writer, he hires an editor, he hires an interpreter. He's, his group gets up to about 25 people at one point. And this is the centerpiece. This is the first picture that opens what will be 30 volumes of the North American Indian, 30 volumes. So the entire project when you see it, and I hope you, some of you get a chance to see it, the Seattle Public Library has a set, so does the University of Washington, and they'll let you see it. But it takes up five feet of, of linear book space. It's 30 volumes. This is the opening picture. Now, he calls this picture, this is from the Southwest, this is in Arizona, and these are the Navajo. He calls this picture Vanishing Race, because and it, he, he said he's been all night in his dark room finishing this thing, trying different things, because he thinks that, um, as do most people, that they'll be gone. That the census has told him that these people are disappearing. So he, he said he wanted this picture to convey a sense of the sort of funereal, uh, the, the passing. That he wanted people to be sad seeing this. Now, 
This is one of my favorite places, and I was so lucky to spend some time here. I'm sure a lot of you recognize this as the Great Canyon de Chez. Uh, to me, it's more extraordinary than the Grand Canyon, and it's a national park run jointly by the Navajo and the National Park Service. And the Navajo lived there for quite a long time. They had peach orchards down there, which Kit Carson had cut down when he went in and during the war to move the Navajo out of their canyon, and they had their own long march. They're in there now. They live there now. People still tend to sheep in that canyon. And what I like about this picture is that it shows the sense of monumentalism, the earth towering over the people. And when Ansel Adams went to start to take his pictures of the American West, who did he credit with inspiring him? This guy, the guy with the sixth grade education, the portrait photographer from Seattle. Because you can see those towering cliffs over those tiny people. Also, uh, when John Ford, the filmmaker, started to do his westerns in the 30s and 40s and went to a place called Monument Valley, which is another extraordinary place, everyone said, oh, my God, John Ford invented the western. Look at those mesas. Look at those buttes. Edward Curtis was there 30 years earlier doing the same sense of how human beings were insignificant against this great western landscape. Now. What Curtis wants to do, as I said, is not just take pictures, not just tell nation stories. He wants to set the record straight. He wants to defy the stereotype. So when he shoots Northwest Indians, he shoots pictures of their longhouses. And he says, look at this thing. This is you know, 150 feet long, 25 feet high, built of all these beams. And they didn't use a nail. They didn't use a crane. They didn't have a bulldozer come in. They didn't have a mill drop off this stuff and have people throw it together. They did it by hand. They did it by all their own stuff. He wants to set the record straight that these aren't just sedentary people sitting around eating clams. That they were great builders, great storytellers, great artists. Now, he, he's running up against a terrible obstacle. He's deep into debt. He's only 31 years old. He's only two or three years into this thing. He never sees his wife. He has three kids, and he's home for Christmas and basically enough time to bounce the kids on his lap and kiss his wife, and then he's off again to somewhere. This, as with all great artists, this is a magnificent obsession. It takes over his life. But he is going deep, deep, deep into debt. So he has to find a way to finance this great project. He bounces around the East Coast. The Smithsonian, which is supposed to be America's addict, as they call themselves, which is supposed to be the great keeper of you know, American ways, will not give him a dime. They say to him, first of all, they diss him because he only has a sixth grade education. They say to him, as Curtis records in his diary, uh, we have Indian experts here at the Smithsonian, and some of them have even seen Indians. <laughs> this really pisses him off because he's now spent you know, about five years almost living with these people. And when he tells them what he's finding, and he says, next, you know, I'm going to go see the Apache, they tell him, he has this letter, I print it in the book, they say, he says, the Apache, I want to record their spiritual ways, and they say, the Apache have no religion. It's a fruitless attempt. So when Curtis writes in the North American Indian his section on the Apache, it's a big bird to the Smithsonian because the very first sentence is, the very first sentence is, everything the, an Apache man or woman does in the course of a day is an inherently religious act. <laughs> and he's just telling them, you know, what do you know? But he doesn't get a dime from them. They close the door in his face. So after several attempts, he ends up in the lair of this guy, J.P. Morgan. Wealthiest American at the time. Largest banker in the United States. He is the de facto Federal Reserve before we have a Federal Reserve. He is no friend of Indians. In fact, if anything, what he's done is hasten the demise of Indians. Because what Morgan, one of the things he did to consolidate, to make himself so wealthy, was to consolidate the railroads to take what were you know, competing railroads and make them non-competing. And so the natives always said, as long as these pilgrims came across and the prairie schooners, we could knock them off. You know, they were afraid of us. And you'll see a picture of Red Cloud shortly, who really did shut down, for example, the Bozeman Trail. But as soon as they started coming in the trains, it was game over. 
There was no way they could stop the iron horses. So Morgan really has hastened the demise of Indians. Curtis tells him he's desperate. He's doing this great project, and Morgan says, there are many people who want my time and my money. I'm sorry, Mr. Curtis, I can't help you. And uh, he gets up to leave, and Curtis says, no, I want to show you one more picture. And before I show you that picture, I'm going to comment for a moment on this picture. This is a famous portrait, by the way, of Morgan, taken by Edward Steakin. You see that thing that looks like a knife down there in the left side? <laughs> He's gripping a chair, and it was the photographer's way of making him look particularly evil. <laughs> and in fact, this is the most famous picture of the most famous and wealthiest banker in the United States. Curtis says, I want to show you one more picture. He shows him this, Mosa, who's a Mojave girl of 10 years old. And Morgan likes it. He actually is a lover of Renaissance art and Botticelli portraits. He's been a big collector of Botticelli and various Renaissance artists, and he loves Mosa. So Morgan agrees to finance the North American Indian. He agrees to fund this great project that Curtis is doing. And, you know, part of it is a publicity reason. There's a headline in the New York Times that says, Morgan money to save Indians from oblivion. <laughs> that was so nice of him. <laughs> but Curtis is ecstatic. He's walking on air after Morgan agrees to fund his project. Um, he makes one mistake. He doesn't give himself a salary. So he will still work for free, but he has enough money for five years to fund his translators, his editors, his people in his dark room, all the, you know, the staff that's working to make this happen. He quickly sets out to take the picture of the second of the three famous Native Americans. That is Red Cloud of the Ogallala Sioux. And there's a wonderful book I just read on Red Cloud called The Heart of Everything That Is. Red Cloud is famous for several reasons. One is that um, he is the only Native American Indian to fight the United States Army to not only a, a, a standstill, but a defeat. And the only Native American to bring the American government to a treaty by virtue of them, he having defeated them. So this happened in the 1870s in uh, Wyoming and Montana. And after Red Cloud won, they shut down the Bozeman Trail. It was just the main northern trail into Montana. So he ba basically held on to the buffalo grounds. He bought about another 10 years' time. When Curtis shoots these pictures, this picture of Red Cloud, it's about 1907. He's an old man in his 90s. It's the only major portrait he shoots of a native where you cannot see the individual's eyes. He's looking down. The second, the third, I should say, of the three famous, some of you may know this, this is Geronimo. Now, he was the last native to fight the Americans, and he was never a chief. He was considered a mystic. He was a, somewhat of a, um, what's the word? Uh, well, he was th thought to have special powers. Uh, he was married to several women. He only had about 10 people with him when the government captured him, almost at the dawn of the two. He jumped back and forth across the Mexican border, basically harassing different people. And they finally caught him. They put him on this tiny little reservation in Oklahoma, and there he lived out his days. Now, in 1904, at Teddy Roosevelt's first real inauguration, remember Roosevelt got to the presidency by virtue of McKinley being assassinated in 1901. Then he, was, he won. And Roosevelt has become a Curtis mentor because Roosevelt is saving original America. He's creating national parks, national forests. And Curtis, through his friendship with Teddy Roosevelt, convinces Roosevelt that just as important as saving our original land is our original people. They're dying in front of us. So Roosevelt becomes an enthusiast, a participant of the Curtis Project. Now, on his inauguration, he invites all these famous Indians to parade in front of Pennsylvania Avenue. One of them is Geronimo. And um, afterward, Curtis takes his picture. It's a cold, rainy, windswept March day. I think that was one of the last times we swore in our presidents in March. And Geronimo shows up to have his picture taken, and all he's wearing is this scratchy, thick, unadorned 
woolen United States Army blanket. You can see him in that blanket right there. And Curtis says, why did you, and again, remember, he always asked people to show up in what, in how they wanted to be shot. People often accuse Curtis, oh, you pose them like this. No, he would say, you show, you come to me with how you want your picture taken. Why did you wear this woolen army blanket? And Geronimo said, this is what the Americans gave me when I surrendered. This is all I have. This is what I got for giving up everything. So it has special importance. Also, what I like about this picture is there's something like the Princess Angeline picture. There's a defiance in that face. So with his newfound money, Curtis expands the project. And um, this is a snake dancer, the Hopi. And he really gets to know the Hopi. You can see this guy sort of giggling. Um, he became very close to the Hopi, and they knew him very well. In fact, he became a priest in the Snake Dance Society, and when they um, initiated him in, into it, he, one of the things they told him he had to do was go catch all the rattlesnakes <laughs> on the day of the ceremony, which wasn't true, but they made him do it. Um, I love this picture because, again, the guy is a, is a close friend of Curtis's, and he, he has that wonderful, wonderful expression. This is Acoma, New Mexico. Now, it pisses me off when I hear constantly people say that, um, oh, what's the town in Florida that is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the United States? Yeah, St. Augustine? Right. They say, you know, the Spanish have been there. Um, Spanish came almost 500 years ago. It's not true. People have been living atop this rock in Acoma, New Mexico for at least 1,000 years continuously, and no one doubts it. It just doesn't get written into the American history. This is the oldest continuously inhabited place in the United States. You can visit it now. I've been there, I went there several times. Curtis shoots that picture, which gives you a sense of people going up to the village, and this, which I'm sure you've seen, called the Old Well at Acoma. He, he loves water motifs and does that quite a bit. I mentioned also that um, he became very familiar with the Hopi. These are these famous, they call them squash blossom whorls in their hair that the women would wear if you were unmarried. And these women were all flirting with Curtis and giggling and coming on to him. And he, as he told later, he had to actually get them to calm down to take this picture. <laughs> he knows the Hopi, as I said, very well. And um, this is where they live which is Wapai. You can still visit this place. I, I went there in the course of um, going all over Indian country to do this book, and um, there's still a handful of people who live in Wapai. Now, the Hopi, you know, are surrounded by the Navajo. The Navajo is a reservation the size of West Virginia. The Hopi are much smaller, and the Navajo are their enemy, so they essentially live in the middle there. Um, he spent a lot of time with the Crow in Montana. This is Hoops in Forehead. Is this guy's name. And he had a very, very close friend named uh, Alexander Upshaw, who was a, a Crow native who was taken, as Indians were at the time, from his reservation and sent to an Indian boarding school and had the Indian washed out of him and then sent back to the reservation. It's really interesting because we value the First Amendment in this country because it gives us free speech and free worship. It is our enshrined major foundation of our freedom. Every person in the United States has the right to practice your religion and worship the God of your choice unless you were Indian. They passed the Indian Crimes Code Act in the late 1880s that made it a felony for so many of the Indian ceremonies to take place. That was only changed in the last 15 years. So they threw people in jail for practicing their religion. Uh, a clear violation of the First Amendment. That's when the court finally ruled on behalf of natives in the peyote society. But it's important to understand, Curtis was sort of an accomplice to a crime. He was trying to take pictures of the outlawed ceremonies, of the sun dance, of the snake dance ritual, of, all, of the bear dance ritual, all these things which the government Indian agents living on the reservations were telling people were against the law. So he, this starts to change him politically too. This starts to radicalize him. This starts to, he goes from being a person who sees Indians as a commodity to seeing the world through their eyes. And he gets angrier and angrier as time goes on. Now what I want to point out about this picture is that, you see that little patch on his shoulder there? This is a cavalry soldier's uniform. And quite frequently, 
when Curtis would have a subject show up, the subject would show up with an army uniform, and he'd say, what's, what's that all about? And he'd say, this, my dad killed this guy. <laughs> this is the best thing we have. <laughs> this is, we will never let this out of the family. So they were quite happy to have that. And so you'll see, you know, the people who don't understand Curtis criticize, oh, yeah, he's got pictures of people wearing army coats. What an idiot, you know. No, they showed up in the army coat. Here's Upshaw. Now, he's sent away from the Crow Reservation to the Carlisle Indian School, where the goal was to, quote, make you a man. Making somebody a man meant you were not an Indian. So they had to... You know, everything you learned is wrong. Your language is wrong. Your religion is wrong. Your rituals are wrong. The way you court each other is wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Just erase your past and become a man. So Upshaw comes back as a man, and he's conflicted. And he becomes Curtis's closest Indian friend. Curtis works with him for almost 10 years. Uh, he's a man who has a foot in both worlds. He totally understands the white world. He's always in court doing translating and legal stuff. And he totally understands the native world from which he came. When Curtis finally took up Shaw's picture, this is what he showed up as. He didn't show up in a suit and a tie. And the tragedy of Upshaw is when he was 37 years old, he got the crap kicked out of him in a bar in Billing, Montana, and they put him in a jail and um, that night he bled to death from the wounds, mostly head wounds, of the beating that happened to him. And when Curtis heard this, heard this, he was just crestfallen. It just destroyed him. He had lost a brother. He was probably closer to Upshaw than he was to his wife in the last five years. He'd certainly spent more time with Upshaw. I mean, they, had, they were together everywhere. One of the amazing things they did was they deciphered the Custer story, the Little Bighorn story. The narrative was not entirely known then. Custer was thought to be a hero. Curtis spent three summers with Upshaw and the survivors of the battle, the Indian survivors of the battle, going over the battle site with his maps, trying to figure out exactly what happened. And he was the first person to figure precisely that Custer had sent his subordinate, Reno, down to the water, if you know the Custer story, for, to their slaughter, that it was poor generalship, entirely poor generalship. He didn't deserve to be a hero, at least a military hero. And when he went, got ready to publish this thing, Mrs. Custer, the, the widow Libby Custer, who lived to like 1937, leaned on President Roosevelt to lean on Curtis. Curtis had told a reporter in the New York Times, I've got this amazing story of what really happened at Little Bighorn. And Roosevelt, he sent this 57-page report, his exhaustive scholarship of what happened to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt said, this is, this is brilliant, but you're playing with fire. He said, memory is a tricky thing. You may get in trouble for this. So Curtis, for the only time in his life, he pulls his punches. He takes the 57-page report on what really happened on the Battle of Little Bighorn, and he puts it in a chest under lock and key, and there it stays until about 10 years ago. Um, I read it in the Library of Congress, and it's strongly credited in the book that came out on Little Bighorn a few years ago. I, the name is escaping me right now. Oh, Last Stand, it was called. Curtis nailed it. The guy with the sixth grade education absolutely nailed it. He figured out what happened there before anyone else figured out. His story is the accepted story right now. And it was amazing to read this document in the Library of Congress and see how much he really did get it. He got it in large part because of this guy, because Upshaw, because he could work with him and, and really get the, the true story. Remember, he was trying to set the record straight, not just on how people live, but what really happened, because the narrative was being filtered through the people who weren't there, through whites. This is one of my favorite Curtis pictures of all time. Um, there's our Columbia River. Biggest river in the West, empties more water in the Pacific than any river in the Western Hemisphere. At this point, there's not a single dam on it. This is upriver near, just upriver from the Dalles. And it's historically important for two reasons. One is, <laughs> there's the undammed Columbia River. You want to see what it looks like at spring tide. The other is, this person is doing dip net fishing the old way. And um, Curtis thought the dip net fishermen were absolutely heroic. 
He said, there may be no better athletes on the planet than these people who bounce around on these rocks above this raging torrent, dipping 35 pound Chinook salmon out of this fast moving Columbia River. When he got to the Columbia River, by the way, Curtis is, now it's 1910, uh, his wife has left him, or she's kicked him out, I should say. He's living at the Rainier Club in downtown Seattle, and a little room upstairs which I visited. And if you get a chance, every now and then the Rainier Club, it's a private club, will open their doors as they did last year at my urging and let the public in. They have become by default one of the premier venues for Curtis photographs. The picture that po Curtis took of Teddy Roosevelt, which Roosevelt said was the best picture anyone ever took of him, the Canyon de Chez picture, Vanishing Race picture, those hang in the Rainier Club. That's how Curtis paid his rent. He was dead broke, ran out of Morgan's money, and so he started giving away his masterpieces to the Rainier Club. And when he didn't want to give away his masterpieces, they made him shoot pictures of bulbous-nosed bankers. <laughs> which he really resented. <laughs> I, I looked at a lot of those pictures and they, although they have the Curtis touch, they aren't among his best stuff. <clears throat> oh, he's broke. He's living in the Rainier Club. He's lost three-fourths of his crew. He's down to just him. Upshaw has died. He's down to just him and an editor, a faithful editor and writer who goes everywhere with him and a cook who's occasionally with him every now and then. He's still got so many tribes to get to through the teens. This is an Arakara called uh, Bear's Belly, one of the pictures he shot um, in the winter. This was one of the rituals that was outlawed by the Indian Crimes Code Act. In the winter that he deciphered the Custer story, excuse me, he went three summers at Little Bighorn and then he spent an entire winter writing it up. He shot this picture one day while going out for water of a Crow native with wood on her back, and I really like it because it shows the, um, it's almost like a Tolstoy-like picture of, of someone just working solo against nature. He has a nervous breakdown in the late teens, early 1920s, and he goes to a, I guess they called them um, sanitariums, or they had other euphemisms for people who had mental breakdowns, and he spends almost a year of his life dark, incommunicado not pursuing the North American Indian, not responding to his good friend at the University of Washington, Ed Meany, not responding to his children, just deeply depressed, um, thinking that this thing is never going to be finished. He's only halfway through it. Broke, uh, he's divorced. His wife gets many of his pictures in the divorce and in a fit of rage after the court awarded them to Curtis's wife, he and his daughter. Now, the, I, I can't entirely answer this. I did interview Curtis's grandchild, their surviving grandchild, but for, for whatever reason, the children all sided with Ed Curtis. And children, it's sad, they tend to side one way or the other sometimes. After the court had awarded her the pictures, he goes across the street to his studio, which was then Kitty Corner from what is now the Fairmont Olympic Hotel. And in fact, if you go to that spot, next time you're in Seattle, go look up at the Cobb building, and you'll see these terracotta Indian figures cut in the stone up there, the terracotta stone, looking down at what was Curtis's studio. It was an homage by the, by the building's architect to Curtis's studio, which was then the, one of the top tourist attractions in Seattle. I mean, this is not an apt comparison, but it was sort of like the Chihuly studio. Um, I think that does a disservice to Curtis, by the way. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Ch Ch Chihuly and I have been feuding. Now, Chihuly, interestingly, is now probably one of the premier collectors of Curtis, so don't get me started on this. Um, but people would come to Seattle just to see the studio. So on, after the court awarded the pictures to Mrs. Curtis, he and Ed and one of his daughters went over and, and broke some of the glass plate negatives smashed some of the masterpieces which never came to light again. So after this year in his depression, he's, he comes out and he's revived. He's now in his late 40s, early 50s, and he goes to California. Um, I was in California this week working on a piece for the New York Times on the drought, and boy, this is when they had water. <laughs> this is in North, Northern California. He had a lot of trouble finding Indians in California. It's interesting. 
There were probably more diversity of tribes in California, and it's paradise to live in. I mean, the weather's nice year-round. If you could have water, you, you had you know lots of wild roots and things to eat, and flora and fauna are there. But um, the tribes are very small. They were basically extended clans. And so when the Spanish and later the Anglos came in, they quickly wiped them out. So when Curtis went to find in the 1920s Native Americans in California, he had a hell of a time. He had to go to the redwood forests and the far north coast, and there he did finally find half a dozen or so tribes, and he shot maybe two of them. And who was with him that time? He was down to his daughter, who accompanied him every place he went. Now, I want to mention briefly, before I close here, on another Curtis masterpiece. He, before he went into the Middle Depression, he tried to do a film, and he uh, assembled all his people, and he went up to North Vancouver Island to shoot this epic movie that became the first film ever shot with an all-Native cast. The first film ever shot of Native people entirely, entirely on location. And um, it took him about two years, and when it was done, it opened in New York and Seattle, and it opened for a week, and it got amazing reviews. People said this is a, you know, he colorized the pictures. He hand-painted many of the slides, excuse me, many, many of the actual images in the film, so it, it, it shows color. And it's this epic native fantasy story, this sort of mythic story of heroes and a love story. It's an amazing, I mean, Hitchcock later said he studied the framing of this picture because of the way he cast it, the way he did the pacing. But um, it got incredible reviews. I, I reprinted them in the book. They said, my God, who knew Edward Curtis was a filmmaker as well? This is a huge breakthrough. Native people, I mean, up until this point, and for like 50 years after this point, if you wanted to shoot Indians in a movie, you put Italians in a back lot in Hollywood. <laughs> That's what they did. And Curtis didn't, you know, he, so he, but what happened was, tragically, there was litigation, the investors sued each other, and the film was pulled and put in a vault, and it took 10 years for Curtis to get it back, so it never played after that one week review. And then during his depressed period, he sold it to the um, Chicago Museum, the Field Museum, for a thousand bucks, and they put it in a vault. And about 20 years thereafter, they pulled this thing out and ran it through the reel, and the thing caught fire. And so he lost many of his frames. Now, there is a happy ending to this story. The folks at the Burke Museum spent 10 years restoring this film. And about four years ago, it played at the Seattle International Film Festival with an all-native orchestral musical group doing the music while it played. And people were just amazed. His, his masterpiece was restored. So you, there is, it did finally, and now it's owned by the Library of Congress and recognizes one of the great film achievements. By the way, here he is in Vancouver Island, still looking somewhat dashing in his Abercrombie and Fitch, which is what he wore. And that's the baleen of a whale that he had towed to the site. He believed in authenticity, he wanted a real whale. He didn't want a fake whale. Um, in the late 1920s, he has, he's chugging through. He's getting the tribes. He's finishing the North American Indian. He's delivering it. He's so in debt to the house of Morgan. He's well, Morgan's gone, but they want to finish the thing, so he owes them more than $3 million, and he just wants to finish this thing. He finally ends up in the far north, and it's just him and his daughter. And he goes up there, and he gets a kayak, and he goes around in the beautiful summer light, and he's just ecstatic. He sees happy people. He sees healthy people. He sees intact people. He sees people laughing. He sees people who are fat. He sees people who are living well off the land. He sees no, people that haven't been, what's the word I want to say, the correct sort of word, haven't been soiled by Anglo contact. And he writes his friend, he said, should some missionary find his way north here, I trust the Bering Sea will do its duty. <laughs> to Curtis, 
the Christian missionaries were his number one enemy. He was usually one step ahead of them. Oftentimes he was behind them, but if they'd been there before him, he was done because they'd cut their hair, they were worshiping in church, they were wearing shoes and doing all the things that people told them they had to do. So he was so happy to see this. And what do you see for the first time in the North American Indian? You see happy faces. And it just looks like a portrait you would have shot yesterday of people. Um, he spends this wonderful summer in the Arctic Circle shooting different native tribes. I, show, I went too quickly through this one, which is a mother and child again. He discovers that there are like 10 different kinds of animal skins they use for a coat like that. He discovers that they have about seven different kinds of coats, just like we had. They had one that was kind of a Gore-Tex. It was dry but breathable. Um, <laughs> that he's fascinated by how they can live pretty well off of, you know, just basically, you know, without a much, much, many vegetables in their diet. Um, he goes to this whaling, summer whaling village right here and gets out of his kayak and he climbs one of these rickety old summer whaling village things and he just shouts to the heavens. He's so happy. He just freaks. Now, I should point out here for historical accuracy that this is about no, 15 miles from what was then the Soviet Empire. So Curtis could see Russia from his house. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. Sorry. <laughs> this is little Diomedes and big Diomedes. And the, the tribe basically shares the channel. But, but the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic is just right across the water there. One of the last tribes he shoots is the... Comanche. Now, anyone who knows anything about the Comanche, there have been a couple of good new books out on them. They were just badasses. They were fearsome. They were known as the lords of the plains. All the other tribes feared them. The Apache feared them. Mexicans feared them. The United States government feared them. They had five different bands who roamed all over Texas. The Texas Rangers feared them. Um, half of eastern Texas didn't get settled because the, the Comanche were such effective warriors. They lived all over the southwest, Texas, Oklahoma, parts of Mexico, parts of Arizona. Um, and Quinaw Parker, the famous Quinaw Parker, who was the son of a kidnapped white woman, and he decided to stay with the Indians rather than come back after he was rescued, was one of their last warriors. He um, led them to their final battles. They, they were decimated by disease, ultimately. And, and put on this reservation, Fort Lawton, Oklahoma. And Curtis, everything he'd read about the Comanche, was very excited. He goes um, down to Oklahoma, and this is what he finds of the Comanche. <laughs> that they're church-going Christians living on this little reservation. And he doesn't do a disservice. He doesn't ask this guy to put a wig on and earrings. He tells him to pose as he wants to pose. And the guy said, I want to pose in my Sunday best. So this picture is called Wilbur Peebo Comanche, and it has a great sense of irony if you knew what the Comanche were. Uh, and I think he's trying to convey that. This picture was shot in 1929, so it's one of the very last. He completes the North American Indian in 1930, so it took him 30 years. He only prints 257 or so complete sets. So if you have a set, there are about five of them in the state of Washington. The uh, University of Washington has one. The Bullitt family of Seattle has one. The Seattle Public Library has one, though tragically it's been vandalized. And about four of the books, the volumes, are completely missing. Um, the uh, Seattle Spokane Public Library has one. And um, there, there's, like I said, there are only 250-some in existence right now. He doesn't own it. He's lost his copyright to Morgan. So in 1930, he's done with the greatest photographic achievement, 40,000 pictures, 10,000 pages of text telling stories, life stories, what people really were like, what they lived, tons of first-hand anthropology and journalism. It's, it's an absolute masterpiece, and he doesn't own it. So he moves to California, and he spends the next... 21 years living in a little apartment in Beverly Hills. Now here he is, the lion in winter, in his last days. He did get some work, piecemeal work, working for the Hollywood studios, taking pictures of fake Indians. 
Um, and he was, in fact, on, on site um, on a couple of the movies, the Westerns that were shot on location in Montana. And he just went crazy because this in the story they always had the whites win and they there were these Italian guys coming out and he was, you know like Curtis knew every rock every tree everything that meant something and he just but he had to do this piecemeal work for Cecil B. DeMille is how he kept himself alive in his old days. It's interesting though and his he's he's 80 in this picture. This is the last known picture of him. 1950. This picture is taken, so he sees a huge part of United States history. He's born in 1868, three years after the Civil War, dies in 1951, so sees this huge part of the American history. But wonderfully for him and for us, in the last three years of his life, a Seattle librarian, yay for librarians, <laughs> a woman named Harriet Leach starts leafing through closet at the Seattle Library and comes upon the North American Indian. She says, holy shit. <laughs> As anyone who's seen these pictures, I mean, they're presented in this magnificent format. There's no pixelation in these pictures. I mean, it's just shot large format. It's just, it's, it's reality. And she's just blown away by this thing. She says, my God, how do we get this thing? Oh, that's the North American Indian that's been lying around back there. And who's this Edward Curtis? He used to be the most famous person in Seattle. He was the original Seattle celebrity before Macklemore. Um, everyone knew Edward Curtis. He was, who did Teddy Roosevelt have shoot his family at the Summer White House? Edward Curtis. Who did he have shoot his daughter's wedding? The sort of Paris Hilton of her day. Edward Curtis. Um, now he's totally obscure. People have forgotten about him. He's living in this little crappy apartment in California. So she, she, is he still alive? She starts this correspondence with Curtis. And over the course of three years, they share 57 letters. He tells her the story of his life. And in this increasingly shaky handwriting, I read all the letters, they have them in the Seattle Public Library. And in this increasingly shaky handwriting, he, he tells this just gripping, gripping account of all the adventures. This guy is Indiana Jones with a camera. You know, he's going down the Grand Canyon. He's down the wild Columbia River. He's over with the macaw hunting whales. He's up on Mount Rainier. I mean, he's dashing around with this huge camera doing this amazing thing. And he, what he's most proud of, he says, do you know that we took more than 5,000 audio recordings of people speaking the language and singing the songs. He said, in many cases, we got the last person to speak the language. And she said, no, I didn't know that. And in fact, that turns out to be incredibly valuable. And when the tribes get money again in the 20th century through casinos and other things, then they start to revitalize their culture. Where do they go to hear what the songs sounded like? Where do they go to hear what the accent sounded like? Edward Curtis's audio recordings because he took around this little wax cylinder recorder with him that E.H. Harriman had given him. And he, never, had never, that, he was never without that thing. And I say it's like this. It's like 100 years from now, we stumble upon all the lyrics to all the Beatles songs, but we don't know the music. We don't know how it goes. We don't see the sheet music, but we just see the lyrics. He gave the audio. So he's very proud of that. And he says to Harriet Leach, the librarian, do you know that the King of England, actually it was newly crowned, I think, Queen Elizabeth, if I have my history right, has a copy of the North American Indian. He said, if you want to see it, you have to go in and put on white gloves. <laughs> and he says, really proud of that. So he does get to tell his story, which is, I... You know, as a person who's a storyteller, I think that's what every human being, I found that out in the Dust Bowl stuff, that that's what we all want. We want to tell our story. So he is broke. He doesn't own anything. He's forgotten. But he gets to tell his life story through Harriet Leach. Now, he dies in 1951. The North American Indian, what's left of it, about 30 sets that Morgan had, is sold during the Great Depression to a Boston bookseller who survives the sinking of the Lusitania. If you read Eric Larson's new book, you'll see that this guy is a major character in the book. So he gets most of Curtis's stuff from Morgan during the Depression when they just want to be gone with it. 
but he dies shortly after acquiring this, and it sits in his bookstore for almost 40 years in the basement. In the 1970s, a group of photographers in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Curtis enthusiasts, because this stuff is getting out, mainly because people are ripping pictures out of the folio and selling them piecemeal. And so they're getting around. Curtis's name is, is reviving 20 years after his death. They hear that it's this great cache in a bookstore in Boston. They go there, they go downstairs, and if you're a bibliophile, it's like finding, you know, the lost gold of Chibola or something. They go down there and there it is. There's Curtis's masterpiece. There's the copper plate negatives he used to print. There's the glass plate negatives. There's hundreds and hundreds of the original pictures living down there, or not living, but down there undercover. And this starts the modern dissemination of Edward Curtis. This starts to revive him. These, these then get sold by collectors and get out there. So two years ago, there was an auction at Sotheby's in New York, and a single Curtis set was for sale. And the single set sold for $2 million. And they say it was the most money paid for a book since the original Harry Potter manuscript was paid. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm sure that Fifty Shades of Grey manuscript will eventually <laughs> do that. So, this is a typical story of an artist. He dies broke and forgotten, and time is good to him. Um, let me close with a note about Curtis. He said when he started this great adventure, he told Bird Grinnell what his motive was. He said, I want to make them live forever. Now, the census of American Indians came out, the last census, five years ago, and it showed there were about four million Native Americans of mostly pure blood. So down from 200,000 to that. So the population not only survived, but had a, a huge renaissance. And I'm so happy, and I was happy to have Roxanne introduce me, because everywhere I went in Indian country, I saw a Curtis picture, because somebody would point and say, that's my great-grandmother. That's me. So let me close with a quote from a native poet, M. Scott Momaday, talked about the effect that it had on him of seeing a Curtis picture. He said, he's a Plains Indian, he said, it struck me with such force that it brought tears to my eyes. I felt that I was looking into memory in my blood. Here was something lost in time. Here we saw my people so close to the origins of their humanity and their sense of themselves. That's what this guy with the sixth grade education did. Thank you. Well, this talk just got me even more excited about the fact that it's 2015 and we natives are still here and we natives are doing better every day. I also just can't help but make a joke. I just wanted to thank you for showing pictures of my cousins. <laughs> Such handsome people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now's the time we're going to allow some of you to ask some of your questions. And we're going to ask you to please come up to the microphones that are going to be brought up here to the front. So while people are coming up, I'm going to start with the first question. Could you please talk about some of your favorite photographs and why they're your favorite? Sure. Um, you know, I, I love the Pacific Northwest stuff, particularly the Columbia River things. The um, rainforest pictures are fantastic. But I have to say my favorite pictures are from Arizona because he, it, 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 it's otherworldly the way he portrayed, as I said, the earth and people. And the, while I love the portraits, I love Angeline, I love Chief Joseph, I love Geronimo, what he did in those faces. I'm also sort of drawn, you know, to the way he, he had these people in context of where they lived. So the Canyon de Chez picture I showed is, is absolutely one of my favorite. And if there's a really wealthy collector who has that picture, I mean, she want to make a donation to the Watka Museum and uh, <laughs> through me. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for that. You know, it really is about knowing who you are and knowing exactly where you come from. So do we have any people who would like to ask some questions? Don't be shy. We're here for you. Yes, yeah, please go to the microphone so everybody can hear you. We've got a microphone right here and right here. Yes, good sir. First to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I have a comment. And that is like many whites or other Americans, I probably knew very little about Edward Curtis except to have seen some of his photographs. Mm -hmm. And your book revealed so much more about what he did and how important that was. It's just amazing. And I thank you for that. Right. Thank you for seeing that. Um, No, th thank you for saying that. I, I got to tell you a quick story. Um, when I was touring for this book, I went to the Smithsonian, and I came, <laughs> I came loaded for bear. I was just going to nail these bastards for dissing Curtis, and and there's this huge crowd, and they were incredibly appreciative, and they said, "Oh, we love Curtis. We have so many Curtis pictures everywhere." And in fact. Um, I spent some time with Edward Curtis' surviving heir, the a grandson, who lives at Port Townsend. And he's in his 80s, a great guy. And he had, he had just given away about a 1,000 or so, mostly candid portraits around the house of Curtis, to the Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> they always win. Yeah. Let's get him back. <laughs> he should have given them to the Watkins Museum. I don't know why he didn't think of that, right? <laughs> we'll take another question yeah. here. Where are the audio recordings housed, and are they available to the public? Yeah, uh, two things on that. They're all over the place. There's no central place for them. If you ever want to see the North American Indian, the pictures, it's online, completely digitized. It's public domain now. That's the good thing about it. No one owns the copyright. So you can go, Northwestern University has digitized the entire thing. And if you have a rainy afternoon and you want to spend it looking through his over, just you can do that. But the audio is not in any one place. However, if you Google some of the audio, some of the tribes and Edward Curtis, that it, there's some of the sound is, is on the web right now, too. Um, when I was interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR, she came up with a whole bunch of those. I don't know where she got them. And played them intermittently during the interview. It was really cool. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Another you question over here? Sorry. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you ever had m much interaction with the other uh, Native American activists of the day, like Jim Thorpe or Ray, Rod Ray Rogers? Yeah. Um, you know, I just anecdotally, I mean, I, hear, I, I went all over Indian country to do this, this book, and so I got to know a lot of the tribes. And I started out thinking that, you know, Curtis would be, you know, not well liked or not well thought of or, or forgotten, but especially in the Southwest and here in the Northwest, um, uh, it was amazing because of the, the, the humanity part of it, the fact of them saying you, they're capturing a real person in a, in a, in a picture. So, but I didn't get to know any of the activist groups. Or, I mean, I, I was following a story. So and when, I, when I'm reporting a story for a book, I just sort of live the dream. I just go so deep into it. I try to imagine. I actually went to his bedroom in the Rainier Club. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and you should see the pictures they have. They're amazing. Okay, another question here. My name is Bob Whitefield and I live in La Conner. I have read your book and I noticed you have two photographs featured full page in your book. One is you show tonight is the fisherman, Wisham, and along the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. And the other is Homeward that you didn't show tonight. Uh, I got both of them, very proud of them. And I'm wondering if you could tell me where Homeward was taken. Where Homer? Yeah, Homeward. It, was that the title of the picture? Homeward. Oh, Homeward, I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, oh gosh. Um, <sighs> you know, I can't tell you, I used to know that though. Um, when I was deep in my research, I, I, you know, I went through all these pictures and I knew where they were taken in the chapter. Do I not mention it in the book? Yeah, then I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, my memory is faulty on that. I don't remember exactly where we took it. Is that the Apache picture? It's a storm gathering. Is that the one? No, the Homeward. Uh, the one of the first, where you got the photograph you got the gold medal for. Oh Homeward. yeah, yeah. No, I don't know exactly where it was taken. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Forty thousand pictures. You got to cut me a little slack. <laughs> Another question here, Madame. 
first I want to just brag that my family got to uh, inherit the vanishing race um, photograph that's in the it's in the original frame and and hung in our home all the years we grew up and we still have it and really enjoy it mm. it's how we fell in love with Edward C. Curtis uh, my question for you this evening was um, maybe I missed it but I didn't hear what happened to his daughter that assisted him for so long and then he ended up being alone what happened yeah he had three daughters and um, and a son and they were all close to him, and they moved to California to be near him. He would have his holidays with them. I didn't tell this story because I was running out of time, but Curtis did one thing that was illegal, and in, in addition to you know, photographing religious ceremonies, which were outlawed, he held on to a single set. He didn't tell Morgan that he had one, uh, which, you know, you could sort of grant him that, um, it was his masterpiece. So in that tiny little room, which he always complained about with a crappy air of Los Angeles, he had on his bookshelf a single set of the North American Indian. When he died, his daughter got that. She held onto it for a long time. And finally, it was sold to the University of Oregon, those damn ducks. Um, <laughs> so they have the Curtis family set. And they say they're taking good care of it. Probably Nike's put swooshes all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next question, please. Hi. I was just curious, in your research, if you found that Edward Curtis may at any time have connected with Emily Carr and our Frank Boas in his, um, as he was going through photographing. Yeah, uh, that name passed through, and um, one of the other interesting things about Curtis was the sort of avant-garde New York photographers discovered him, and he didn't really discover him, but they, they started to celebrate him, and you know, he was not classically trained. He was trained by walking around, taking pictures, studying faces, and they, they used to do these really artsy, you know, um, uh, long uh, stories on him in the art magazines in New York, and they would, they would use terms he didn't even understand. He'd say, well, you know, I just go for the light, or I go for the face, and they go, no, you are clearly, the French did this first, and you, you know, and, and he would, no, I, I don't understand, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, <laughs> and, which is a great thing about an artist like him. So, but he, he passed through most of the photographers of his day. Uh, Imogene Cunningham, mm -hmm. are you familiar with her? Mm -hmm. She was a studio technician for him for a while and learned at the, House of Curtis for about, in, in his studio in Seattle for about five years. Um, and was actually influenced, her Rainier pictures were influenced by him. Um, and I mentioned Ansel Adams, I mentioned John Ford as well. Thank but you. He, he just had no time. I mean, I call this book Short Nights of the Shadow Catcher. The, the natives gave him two nicknames. One was the Shadow Catcher, because that's what he was trying to do. The other was the man who sleeps on his breath. And the reason he got that nickname is because he was the first guy to show up with an air mattress. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love native humor. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I wish we had names like that. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, please. Yeah, his career uh, seemed to span so much time working on this, and given the rapidity of, uh, or, or, uh, of technology, I'm wondering, did his equipment change, or do you know anything about that from the 1890s? No, that's to... a really good question. The equipment did change, but his did not. Um, he stayed with the glass plate negatives. Um, now, certainly, he was somewhat of a techie. Now, yeah, he would have been fascinated by all the, that you could have everything in the palm of your hand right now because he did have this audio recorder before anyone was using it. He did get into film big time uh, and, and really advanced the art, not just visually and artistically, but technically. But stubbornly, when everyone told him to use smaller cameras than that and print with film instead of glass plate negatives, it was really dangerous working with these chemicals. I mean, the stuff would frequently catch fire. And it was time he'd find him in his dark room and he'd be passed out. Um, so he, but he stayed to the very end because he liked the, the clarity of those glass plate negatives. It, was, it became really hard to print. So, um, yeah, so that's what he did. But he, he really, interestingly, he had a tech side to him. He was fascinated by all the 
gadgets and all gadgets and all the new stuff coming online. So let's take one more question. That, yeah. Please. Okay. Native. Well, well, Layton. I am well, well, Layton. Just a layout to Tanuka to look Nuk Lummi. I'm from the territory of the Lummi. This is my place of origin and place of origin of the Nooksack and the Lummi people, as well as all Coast Salish people. And it's interesting, uh, I was looking around at the audience to see how many native people are here. See, I'm an Escalate, I am. And you know, we're so close. We're so close to Lummi, it's just right here. Now, I don't know how many of you people come out to Lummi, but it'd be interesting to see you come out to Lummi and say hello to us. We're just a hop, skip, and a jump. But I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> and Stomish is coming up the second week. In June, the water, the, the canoe races, and the, the, the longhouses, etc. I am just pleased. I, I taught Lummi language at Ferndale High School for 10 years and at Northwest Indian College, uh, in the Coast Salish Lummi language, and uh, in our history of our people. And I went to, um, let's see, Santa Fe and collected some pictures of. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and Curtis, and was was um, uh, impressed with uh, the ability to, as you stated, uh, there's plates and uh, bronze plates and photographs taken out of place and, and and for sale, and you would wonder how does this how does this happen? And I I, I it wasn't too hard to come up with well this is bootleg. Mm -hmm. This is bootlegging, and people, we do not, native people are not allowed to know our own history. They, they, we're not allowed to, to speak our languages. And just more recently, the 1990 Native American Language Act was passed. Well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm getting too long in the tooth. <laughs> and I don't like to do this. I, and I don't like to point fingers at people. It's just not my way. It's just not my way. Though I'm, I've been full of anger, and I have been told who I am. I'm 67 now, and I, I, I have got time for people telling me who I am. I, I, I learned how to investigate and, and to pass on information to, to my students, and I'm retired now from teaching. But I do, 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 uh, do like to say about the Northwest Indian College on Sunday, and uh, give you some lessons for free. <laughs> so show up, huh? On that excellent note, this concludes our event for this evening. I really want to thank you all so much for being here. Haishka Siam, thank you.